Next from Springfield, we attend a hearing of the House Budget Oversight Panel, with representatives asking Tim Nutting, the director of the Illinois Governor's Office of Management and Budget, about the effects of the governor's latest $26 million in budget cuts. This runs about 35 minutes. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman, and thank you very much, um, Director Nudin and Acting Director Bassey for coming before us today. We appreciate all the work that you've been doing and just want to go over a few things because when we set out this year, um, we knew coming in and the administration and the governor knew coming in that we were coming into a state that was really on the brink, brink of financial disaster, which we've talked about for the last couple of years, how important it was to balance the budget. And I know that you've come in under tough decisions, and we respect that. You know, the, um, we had been downgraded, I think, over 20 times by the bond houses over the last several years. And moving into the 2016 budget, we knew that that was going to be a tough budget because those of us that serve on the budget committee felt that the 2015 budget was underfunded at the time. And that's why when we had, you know, for those of us that serve on human services, we had all the child care people in here three weeks ago, and we were just determined to try to find a solution so that we could fund those people, so that we could fund the court reporters, and so that we could fund corrections. So we know that you were trying to assist in that, and we all knew, especially the people that are here today, that are the heads of the appropriate committees, their heart-wrenching decisions have to be made. And, you know, we, whatever the timing may be, we know that we wanted to keep those people in. And I think that with the 2015 budget, as some others have brought up, we jeopardized a lot of the funding of social services, human services, and business in that budget. You know, so right now, I think what we're trying to do today and moving forward is to work with you on what decisions and solutions we can do to move forward on whatever, if we're you know, still discussing the 2015 budget, but also the 2016 budget, because that's what we're trying to do in accomplishing a real balanced budget. And whatever decisions we want to try to make, make together and look at them. But I think that the administration I say that you, I understand what you were trying to accomplish in those tough decisions, and we know, I know there are a lot of people that have real concerns, and including myself, because we're in the trenches dealing with people, and I know you are out there trying to turn the state around and to have a balanced budget this year in 2016 and to pay the bills, because all of us care about the people and the families in our communities throughout the state of Illinois. We care about the health care issues. We care about the human service. We want to bring businesses back to Illinois. We're tired of hearing about the out-migration in Illinois, and we want to bring that back. And I think the answer to that problem is to get a balanced budget in 2016 and to try to make the best choices and priorities of the programs that serve the most people that are essential. You know, so um, I look forward in this committee to working with you and to working all the others that serve on this committee into moving forward on solutions to these issues. Thank you very much. All right. Rep next, we have Representative Wallace. Again, be brief because you're not. A Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I do appreciate uh, you each coming before us this morning. I will say I do appreciate. Um, assistant or acting Secretary Bassett's leaning on other individuals with expertise in human services as a doctor in educational psychology and a former family therapist, human services is very dear to me. Um, I am, my couple of questions are, uh, what forms of communication were utilized to get the message out? Um, so this is kind of, Picking back up where Representative Ammons left off, I know she requested a specific list moving forward, but on Thursday evening or Good Friday morning, um, what forms of communication were used to reach out to the members of the House and Senate regarding these decisions? Yeah, I'll take that, Representative. And again, I think, uh, as I mentioned to Representative Crespo, uh, that's a fair point. Uh, Moving forward, we are continuing to share as much information as we can. We could have provided more specific information in that instance, uh, and I regret not doing that. Um, we are doing that going forward. I think you have lists uh, of all of the programs where we have either reserved spending or sus suspended 
spending. I believe you have a list of DCEO projects that have been suspended. You have the DHS and public health projects that have been suspended. Going forward, when other actions will be taken, and other actions, frankly, will be taken, we will be doing a better job of communicating that with your staff so that they can communicate with you on, on what is happening. I would greatly appreciate that. My senator and I were completely blindsided. Um, and so that's neither here nor there. Let's move forward. Um, my, my next question is just simply, how is it that we're not sure these cuts in terms of human services and public um, health, how have we determined whether or not those cuts are simply shifting costs? For example, we understand that some of the outreach programs for teens um, help reduce crime. Um, we understand that child care services um, help for individuals to be able to be in the workforce. Were it not for those very programs, I would not have completed my doctoral degree. I'm trying to understand how are we not, how are we so sure that we're not shifting cost? Because an incarcerated individual costs us tens upon thousands of dollars each year versus a $600 a year um, funding for a teen to attend an after school program? Um, I think the answer to that, and, and, it's, and it's not a great one, is that we're not sure what the overall impact of some of these is going to be. We're in a situation that is, has rightly been termed an emergency. It's a crisis, and we're making the most uh, as we go. It's an inexact science, and it's not a perfect, uh, a, it, it's not a perfect solution, but it's the best solution we have in an emergency. And so we didn't have the luxury of analyzing each program by program what the, what the long-term effect and what the long-term cost would be. That said, other programs that did not get, uh, that did not get reduced or suspended also provide you know, long-term gains that, that, that are essential to this state. And so um, the overall picture is what we try to look at, and then we look at what can we get, what can we get through this year, what is needed for this year in an emergency in order to balance the budget. And so that's the approach that we took, and so I'm afraid that's, that that's the best answer I can give you. I do appreciate that. I just think we need to make sure that in trying to get out of this crisis, we don't, don't create future crises. And I would believe, or I'm pretty sure that there has to be um, formulary efforts that we could take to kind of figure out that cost benefit and future projections of what these cuts actually could mean in the future. There are plenty of ways to mathematically figure that out. And I hope that we will do that in the future. Thank you, Representative David Harris. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, just very briefly, if I can, uh, I'd like to, in some historical context, uh, go back to what my uh, esteemed colleague, the uh, Chairman of the General Services Appropriations Committee, made reference to earlier. And he does have more than four friends in the House when he put forward a uh, uh, governor's uh, not recommended budget. The reason that we all voted against that non-recommended budget, because quite frankly that budget was as phony as all of the other budgets that the former governor used to put forward, uh, it was not based in reality at all. And one of the reasons it wasn't based in reality was it failed to co uh, consider the fact that we had $1.6 billion from the April surprise that was sitting out there that was not factored in. That budget was simply based on uh, the revenue estimate of a lower uh, uh, tax uh, uh, receipts or lower revenue receipts. I'd also like to comment about the fact that the budget process uh, is not just a single vote in the House, but rather contains five votes in the House of the individual appropriations bills. Uh, and if uh, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle will reference the fact that there were indeed at least one legislator who voted for both the general services appropriations budget as well as the education budget as well as the appropriate supplemental appropriations budget. So it was not totally a, a, a strict uh, partisan vote. Having said that, um, uh, Mr. Newding, a couple of questions regarding the grant terminations if I may. Were the grant terminations retroactive or were they simply prospective? In other words, did they go back to January 1 or were they, were they prospective? I believe the vast majority of them are prospective and I think the, the intent is to suspend the grant agreement 
reconcile payments with those vendors or programs or whoever they may be to take care of whatever spending they have incurred under that grant agreement from that point until the suspension letter was issued that the state will cover that and then the remainder will be uh, savings to the state. Uh, okay, that leads me then to my second question, which may, may, you may have uh, sort of answered. There is an issue, and I've read in the paper, uh, although I have not been contacted, but there is an issue, I mean, with the uh, funeral and burial yeah. uh, grants. I mean, what do you do with a dead body? I mean, we have been providing for that. How do you, how do you handle that? Are we handling it with the funeral directors or the, uh, or the nursing homes? Uh, I mean, what, what, what's the procedure by, what, by way of what we've been covering previously? Yeah, and I think that one, Representative, is one where we, that may have been suspended as of a certain date, which, could be which would be characterized as retroactive. I, I'm not sure, maybe the end of December. J J um, Mid-January. Mid okay. The middle of January, is that, yes. So uh, that was the middle of January. Middle of January. So that was retroactive. Yes, but uh, they were provided notice back in, yeah, they've been provided notice since January, so it's from that date. So although that one is retroactive, notice was provided to, to the providers for funeral and burial as far back as January. Okay, I mean, I'm not being, I don't want to be critical here, and I, uh, believe me, we have a serious uh, financial issue that we've got to address, and I recognize the governor's trying to, uh, uh, to handle this as, as practically as he can by way of balancing the budget. But what do you do with a dead body? I mean, how do you, how do you handle that? I mean, it, it, there's an issue gloves. here of, of coverage of getting somebody buried. It, it's, it's a difficult situation. It's a very difficult situation. What we're faced with is traditionally um, funeral and burial costs were handled by uh, the locality, so counties, cities, uh, and that's the majority of states nationwide do the same. Um, we're committed to working with those providers and with the lo local communities to find the best way forward, and it's not an easy solution. But we, we, we are going to have our program folks try to find a solution, but the funds just aren't there for the rest of this year to fund those programs. Well, that may be part of an answer. You may have told me that now you're going to, we are now putting the burden on the local municipalities to, to cover that. Whether or not that's an appropriate answer or a good answer, uh, but it is an answer. Okay. And then the second, uh, second uh, part of this, you have talked about resumption, if, if perhaps additional sweeps could be made, a resumption of some of, these, uh, some of these services. Is that correct? Yeah, that issue has been raised, um, and I do believe uh, they're, they're in the Senate they may be working on that. And I think what the governor has said is uh, we are continuing to work to balance this budget. Uh, in the process of working with the legislature to get the approval to do certain things that we need to be able to do to close this gap, we lost both time and resources. So we lost two months of time. When you're in the middle of a fiscal year, obviously time is money. The sooner you can stop spending, the more money you can save throughout the fiscal year. We also lost uh, resources in the sense that our list of fund reallocations that the governor was willing to approve was actually larger than what was actually approved by the legislature in House Bills, in House Bill 318. Uh, there were funds that we would have been okay reallocating monies from where monies sit today that the legislature was not okay with. What the governor has said is that if we are willing to revisit that, he is willing to look at that as well and may be willing to support some additional reallocations to mitigate some of the actions that we are taking to try and balance this budget. Okay. Uh, one, uh, one last, well, one maybe next to the last point. You've taken a lot of heat for what you've done, and it's not easy, and we understand we have to balance the budget. I, I would tell you that if you're, if you're going to make a, if you're gonna make a statement that these things are going to be stopped, they should be stopped, because the difficulty is you can't stop them and then start them. I mean, the, the, the on again, off again, it's very difficult for, for an entity, for an organization to say, okay, one week those children can't come into the center and we don't know if you're ever going to be able to come into the center and then they get word from the government that, well, the funds are back on so now you can come into the center a, a month and a half or two months later. If you're going to make the reduction, 
make the reduction, stick with it. Um, I know it's hard uh, and it's not easy for, for lots of people to hear that, but at the same time, you can't have an off again, on again. And then let me just close. We've talked about the, uh, the funds, you, you use the term fungible. The, the sweeps went into general revenue. Uh, yes, sir. Think, okay, then I would suggest that you not reference the court reporters, because unless I'm mistaken, court reporters were paid out of the personal property replacement tax and if I'm also not mistaken, the 317, 318 used personal property replacement tax funds and not general revenue for the court reporters. Thank Point you. taken. Thank you, Representative. Representative Bradley. Representative Harris, um, there's a guy sitting behind you that may be able to help you with your burial questions. Thank you, gentlemen, for being here today. Um, Couple of questions, and then we're going. I think we're going to move on to the um, to the real folks that are here to talk. So, I supported your supplemental appropriation. I was one of the Democrats that did that, and there was 136 million dollars of fund sweeps in that. Is that right? Uh, 1.36 billion. Yes, sir. Okay, 1.36 billion. And so you indicated that of that 1.36 billion, that that money went to child care, court reporters, and Department of Corrections. That that was your testimony. Among a few other minor items. Okay. With well, the what clarification are those other, that represented. What are those other minor items? Did you just ask me what comes under minor items? You just used the term among some other minor items. Well, you know, like uh, I, think, I think some money, not that it's minor, but I think some money went into making sure mm -hmm. that uh, fracking operations could get going at the Department of Natural Resources. How much? A um, couple, couple million dollars. Two million dollars? Two million, I believe, sir. What was the amount that was put into child care from the 1.36 billion? It's somewhere in the neighborhood of 280 million dollars. And what was the court reporters? Two, uh, 260 million. 200. I'm sorry. 200. 260 and, million. In the child care. In the child the, care, yes. Okay, and then the court reporters actually came out of PPRT, as Representative Harris indicated. So that wasn't actually paid from the fund sweep transfers, correct? I believe Is that, that correct? Yeah, that's accurate, yes, sir. Okay, so we can take that off the list. We can add a DNR for two million. And then the other, is that right? That's correct. And then Department of Corrections was how much? 114 for corrections and another five for DJJ. Now, if you want to reallocate, then we've got to take money from somewhere else to reallocate to another point. I mean, look, the honest to God truth is the legislature passed $100 in promises and $80 in revenue, and we're cutting $20 to try and balance it out, and that's why we're having this hearing today. But we're still having a hard time figuring out where that $20 went. <laughs> yeah, we, we got the, we we know where about 450 went, but there is about 1550, and the, the, this goes back to what Representative Bradley said. You know, where where did the rest go? There's you know, a and if, 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 if this was not adequate, then why is it signed into law? Why didn't we do a deal that actually solved the problem? Taken all together, it will be adequate. And had you not passed these bills. I'd be out there today with my staff and these agencies looking for another 1.4 to 1.5 billion dollars in budget cuts, or we'd be pushing bills off, or we'd be looking to borrow to fund operations. I will try to the best of my ability to get you a financial rack up of where we believe we stand today. So why is but, it better to just take money from other funds instead of borrowing it and doing the fiscally responsible thing and paying back those money to the funds which I, owed I hope to persuade you, Representative, that that is not the fiscally responsible thing. That borrowing for operations is not a good idea. If we borrow from those funds, I mean, those are state funds. We move that money into the general revenue fund and we are 
helping to close the hole in FY15. If you borrow those funds, you will get the same effect in FY15, but you're gonna have a $650 million bill next year that you're gonna to have to pay back to those funds when we're trying to fund Medicaid, when we're trying to fund childcare, when we're trying to put together a very difficult FY16 budget. When you budget. borrow from your savings account, you know, it's responsible to put the money back you know, over time as you earn more money. I, I don't think that's a problem. But in the Senate, you talked about another $200 million worth of cuts yet coming. Is that? Uh... That was misinterpreted. I think they said I had, we had $100 million more in cuts coming. Uh, no, what I said was, I think we needed outside of what the bills did. I feel like we needed $100 million of savings outside of those actions. And those are happening either in reserves or the grant suspensions that we're talking about today. But there will be other actions coming, which I think I mentioned to Leader Bradley, that we are um, gonna be doing the two and a quarter, which is not gonna be a big amount of money. And we're gonna be doing the Medicaid reductions, which will be significant and we will be talking to you about both of those before we do. So you've got a billion six in what we did already. On top of that, $26 million of you know, shutting down programs and another hundred and some million. So now we're up to close to $2 billion. No, no. what you did was not a billion six. What you did was a billion three six six from other funds and maybe maybe a hundred million dollars in savings. What we're doing on our own is trying to close the gap with the rest. And that's why we've needed to continue to do what we're doing to try and close that gap. And again, I know there was a misunderstanding there. I don't know how to do it any other way other than to tell you in committee and to tell your staff that these activities will continue short of being invited to your caucus, which I know doesn't happen. So. I, don't, I communicated through the appropriate channels to the best of my ability. So for folks back home you know, who may be listening you know, and to their bankers and the people who are extending them lines of credit, when are they going to know whether, you know whether the state is going to make good on its obligations to them or if the state is going to say, we're not paying you uh, or the value of your contracts? I mean, this is coming up with banks back home. You know, when do they stop lending based on uncertainty about how the state is going to perform its contractual obligations? I think if grants have been suspended, folks need to operate under the assumption that those are going to be suspended through the end of the fiscal year. And I would say to you, I totally get what you're saying. I mean, I, you're, we don't want to be in this position. This is what happens when you have crisis governing. I want to pass a balanced budget and not have to revisit the budget in the middle of the year. Revisiting the budget in the middle of the year because the budget's unbalanced and you have to make cuts to balance it out causes stress, causes grief, causes consternation for you, certainly for the per people that provide those services, for the people that have to implement these reductions to make the budget balanced. Let's don't do any more crisis governing. Let's do a balanced budget and so people have stability and predictability to where they know what they're getting and they know they're going to have it all year long and they can manage accordingly. So the other representative Harris, who's wise beyond belief as all Harris's are, you know, mentioned, um, you know, when are we going to know, you know, I, I think a lot of this hinges on April receding, that we know that there are, there's a possibility because of the effect of uh, just uh, timing issues. When are we going to know what our April receipts are? Uh, you know, I don't know the answer to that. Um, certainly, I would think within a few days after April comes in. Um, I would think within a few days after April comes in. But do you think it would be so why? Let's, so why, let's say it's May 5th, maybe. Do you, do you plan to make your decisions going forward to do your other $126 million in cuts before you know what our revenue number is? Or are you going to do that before April, the end of April? Well, we have a revenue estimate on file. It's, uh, it's very close to what COGFA's revenue estimate is. Um, I do not want to make changes or assumptions based on you know, what might come in. We are proceeding to try and balance the budget with the information that we have at our disposal today. You know, if there are positive revenues down the line, uh, we'll have to take a look at that. But I would caution the committee and members that it's very easy when you're making difficult decisions 
to try and just fudge the revenue number a little bit to make it all seem okay. It's a very dangerous game to get into. Yeah, but in other years, you know, we haven't fudged the number, and I really object to you know you, you, you saying that we did on revenue numbers. You know, we I think we're very responsible through the work Representative Bradley did and Representative Harris did on setting you know adequate revenues. Sometimes it underperformed. The last couple of years, it has overperformed largely because of you know uh, changes in federal uh, capital gains tax. And in April and after April, we made supplemental appropriations to pay some of these bills. So I think it's actually prudent to see where the April revenues come in. You know, we think that you know because of the net operating loss carry forward changes that were made a couple of years ago, we may see more come in this April. Wouldn't it be better to wait to see what the actual numbers are than put our people back home through a, a lot of chaos and a lot of consternation, laying off workers, you know, closing down businesses, and then finding out, well, more revenue may have come in. We didn't have to do this after all. Well, here, your, your point is very well made. Here's the risk in that. If we wait until the end of April, middle of May, to make the further reductions that need to happen and those revenues don't come in, then those reductions are even harder and a shorter time period for those folks to deal with. The end of April is nine days. Well, that's, I mean, how much time do we have left in the fiscal year? Okay, hey, thank you. Are you finished, Representative? Yeah, okay, Representative Davis. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Sir, would you agree that in balancing a budget, sometimes it's not just about making cuts, it may be a need for additional revenue? Uh, I think balancing a budget is certainly, it's simply making revenues and expenditures match, that's correct. Well, you didn't answer my question. So when you say revenues and expenditures match based on maybe tax receipts and things of that nature, I understand. But isn't it possible that in order to achieve what you're seeking that you may need to actually get new revenue? Uh, sir, I am operating under the environment that I am living in right now. Can you just, uh, answer, tax. The, can you just answer my question? Yeah, yes no? I have to make cuts to balance this budget because of the revenue situation, uh, the revenue environment that exists and we are we are making those reductions so is that a yes or a no i don't i don't understand your question then i, I well don't I, I thought it was pretty clear sometimes in order to make things work the way they're supposed to isn't there a need to get new revenue to have new revenue representative when the New, new, you understand what I mean by new revenue, right? You can balance a budget with revenue or spending reductions if it's out of balance. You are correct. So, new revenue? You understand what I mean by new revenue, right? Revenue, monies that you didn't have, yeah. that you may have to make policy changes in order to achieve. Right? Yeah, and I would characterize the fund reallocations as, as possible new revenue, certainly to the GRF. Well, taking you said as possible new revenue, so is it new revenue to you or not? Is the uh, uh, fund reallocations? Yeah, you just said it's new possible. revenue to the GRF from revenue that's in but existing is, but is, funds. But it's existing revenue. Though. I don't know what you want me to say, Representative. I think he wants you to say whether you're for or against new revenue sources. I think that's what he's asking. And you may answer it okay, or not, that's, but that's one way that's of saying it. I, just, okay. I mean, you can choose not to answer, but I'm asking you: right. Is it possible to achieve what you're trying to do by obtaining new revenue? Uh, yes, as I mentioned, new revenue or spending reductions will help balance a budget. Okay, I mean, we get that you guys want to cut spending. I'm clear on that, but sometimes there might be a need for new revenue. I'm just wondering, does that come to figure into your equation at all? Well, we have not proposed new revenue, no, sir. Not proposed it yet. No. Rep okay. Representative David Harris. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Madam Chairman. And just uh, to track on what my previous, uh, what my, my colleague just said, but to come to your defense, if I'm not mistaken, by statute, you have to introduce a budget which is based on current law, meaning based on what the tax revenue is today, not on what may be uh, possibly changed in the future. Is that, am, I, am I correct? That's correct. We had, that, yeah, that's correct. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, except that the, the budget proposed included, I believe, $2.2 .2 billion in savings from a pension program that has not, as far as I know, even been introduced in the legislature, let alone passed and signed into law. 
I don't know if you want to address that, Mr. Newding. Uh, I will. I, uh, you know, the bu governor's budget uh, is a proposal, just like past governors. It's a proposal. Um, there are all sorts of plans in that budget that would require statutory changes or actions by the, by the legislature. Um, if we were forced to provide a budget under current law that adhered to existing revenues and existing statute on spending, we would almost by definition have to present to you an unbalanced budget, which would be and unconstitutional. And maybe you have. Representative Crespo. Thank you, Leader Curry. Uh, Director Newney, I just need to follow up on, on one of your responses. Uh, again, I'm trying to reconcile these numbers. So one of the things, the sweeps under House Bill 317, we were under the impression that uh, they resulted in $1.3 billion. Is that correct or not? Yeah, 1.36 was the number that was in the okay. bill. Now, I heard you, now, the 2.25% cuts, our understanding was that that translated into $300 million. But what I heard you say that today is that that's not necessarily the case. No, that is not necessarily the case. So how much did the 2.25% cut would that come up to? I think coupled with the Medicaid reductions, which I, were- I'm just looking at House Bill 317. Which, oh, just uh, in the appropriation? You, right. We, we, again, we were under the impression that 2.25% cut across the board resulted in $300 million, but you just gave us the example of the 80-20%. Uh, <laughs> uh, so that I'm trying to reconcile. What did the 2.25% amount to so we're going to get you those numbers i think it's in the range of maybe maybe a hundred million dollars maybe just the two and a quarter percent reductions then of course we took other actions on our own prior to that no i understand but i'm just looking specifically at the bill that we voted on right and so what i'm hearing today is that and there's a huge difference between 300 million and one hundred million dollars. Well, I think I think that what we're where we're talking past each other is you are probably dealing with appropriation reductions, and I'm talking about what's actually saved by those appropriation reductions. So it brings me to another point. Yeah, because I've, I've heard you say several times today that there people were misinterpreted, you were being misinterpreted, misunderstood. I've, had, I've heard that on several occasions in the last hour and a half. And, and again, we go back to this trust and credibility as we move forward. And, and I would ask you, please, if, if you feel, wait a second, I don't think that the other side understood what I meant. I don't think they understood how the numbers added up. We would like to know because that's a difficult time. That's, that's what I'm having a, a difficult time with. Uh, and in case in point, it's a 2.25. I think it was. We saw that in the press. We saw that in memos. That 2.25% cut across the board equated to $300 million. But you're telling us today, no, nah, there's some other factors that you have to take into account. It really does not. Again, you're going to give us some information. I guess we can drill down and, and try to figure that out ourselves. And, and you've mentioned a couple of times that this crisis. I'm not going to argue that. There is a crisis. But, but what I feel is that we're creating a bigger crisis. That is not helpful. And, and I've been here eight years, and, and, and it's being a, a suburban, very fiscally conservative legislator. Uh, I learned very quickly that uh, working on the budget is not only a math equation. We cannot ignore the social responsibility. And we need to balance that. And I just, again, as of today, April 21st, I just feel that we're ignoring that social responsibility. It's not as easy as running the business. And I'm telling you, as a former manager in the private sector, I, it's just there are two different animals, running government and, and, and running a business. The other thing, my last point, Leader Curry, uh, I also agree that running a supplemental every year is not a good way to do business. Sometimes things do come up and, and we're gonna have to do it, but it's, since I've been here, it seems like it's become an MO. We always have to run a supplemental and we see things that we did not expect, or we see things that we anticipated, Now oh, we kind of figured that was gonna happen. 
During, during one of my uh, appropriation hearings, we had the director of CMS, and forgive me, I forgot his name. Um, I think he was very well qualified, very impressed by, by, by the, uh, the, the director. And under CMS, there's an assumption of saving, I forgot what the amount was for healthcare insurance. Yeah. Um, do you know what that number is? Uh, I believe it's somewhere in the neighborhood of $700 million. $700 million. So, yeah. so under the assumptions of CMS, they introduced a budget where they uh, are, are already factoring in a saving of $700 million. And I asked the director, well, please help me understand, what happens if you don't achieve the $700 million that you think you will? Because we don't know. Can, can you, you answer that? Briefly, uh, Mr. Newdy. I can, yes. Uh, we will work with the legislature to try and, and actually we'll negotiate with the union as it stands to try and achieve those savings. That's a proposal. If we're able to achieve more savings than that, I will be advocating for reducing appropriations more than that. But it is what it is. It's a proposal. Um, I would not advocate for cutting more than we save as we negotiate with the union. So, so the point I was trying to get to, going back to the supplemental uh, uh, process that we have, yeah. and what I'm hearing you say is depends on what you get. And there's an issue of timing here because we need to finish our budget by May. I don't think you know what, how much you're going to save by the end of May. So, but I'm just going back to, my, to the hearing that I had with CMS and other agencies. So again, I was trying to understand if you don't achieve those savings by the end of May, by which time I have to introduce the budget. What happens next? And I'll yeah. tell you what the response was. Fine, we'll come back next year for a supplemental. Well, no difference from the <laughs> ML, which raises the question of the $2.2 billion in savings that Leader Curry brought up. Is that the intent that if you don't achieve those savings during this budget process, you can come back next May for a supplemental bill before this General Assembly? Well, you want to make sure the resources are there first before you ever ask for a supplemental. My intent is ne to negotiate with you and others a balanced budget based on the best information we have available at the end of May. But, but you understand. Yeah. Representative, and you mentioned you... you mentioned the timing issue, right? Yes. You have to do this by the end of May. Yes. Are you going to achieve $2.2 billion in savings and pensions and $700 million in insurance by the end of May? If we don't pass pension reform, we're not going to see any savings, so. But, but again, going back to your point, Director yeah. Nudy, we have until the end of May. You brought up the issue of timing. Yep. So please help me understand how is that going to happen between now, April 21st, and the end of May, where we're going to pass a pension reform bill for savings of $2.2 .2 billion, health insurance savings of $700 million. And I need to know, because I have to work on this budget, how are we going to, you know, and we're taking credit for that for fiscal year 16. So help me understand how we're going to do that in the next. I think that you maybe we'll get some answers, Representative, when he gives us in writing all the criteria they okay. have used, the principles that govern the decisions they so far have made. We have we have had waiting in the audience families with autistic children.